What's up, everybody? Thank you for joining us here on the Tattoo Historian's Twitch channel. Uh, as you all congregate in, I want to say I really appreciate you all hanging out with me earlier this week. When I was doing some streaming. I might do some streaming tomorrow night. But uh, this is an event that we have put off for far too long. And I'm so glad that we're getting a chance to do it one more time. Uh, hopefully it won't be the last time. Uh, this round of Historians Off the Clock. And joining me tonight are the two guys that I was going to have on 55 weeks ago, uh, my my good friends, Keith Harris and Joe Rizzo. Gentlemen, good evening. Greetings, John. How's it going, Joseph? Going well, thanks. Yeah, the long-anticipated historians off the clock. Yeah, yeah. This, this is, we've, we've held off for so long. Mm -hmm. I, I've told the guys before we went live that uh, I did not do another one of these until we could make up for the one that we had to cancel on January 6th of 2021 so uh and you probably could understand why we canceled <laughs> that night uh i'll never forget that day though because it was just a flurry of messages between us like oh, i think this is a bad idea to go on and we didn't get just to do it till tonight so. yeah i remember obviously i remember that day well but i remember sending you that message where that afternoon i had a meeting at three o'clock that day too and i remember i sent them a message i was like maybe we should do this in another day. And one person didn't know what was going on. They're like, Oh, what's, what's up? I was like, I want to turn the news on. Yeah. I was at, uh, I was at school that day and uh, you know, texting back and forth with my wife and then checking, you know, checking all the things. It's like, Oh my God, I couldn't believe that was actually happening. So then, you know, of course, John and I chatted quickly and thought it would probably be appropriate to postpone. And so yeah. here, here we are. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was in the car. I didn't know what was going on. I was just, you know, driving along and I all of a sudden could see my phone on the dash lighting up mm -hmm. and it was just a couple of messages coming through right away. And people are like, <clears throat> you see what's going on? And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And, you know, I was the furthest out of the loop. I don't think I got home until near the end of the day before I saw the, what was going on. And we had already started talking about, Hey, let's postpone. And when I heard and saw then what was going on, it's like, well, yeah, obviously we're not going to, we're not going to go on and have our usual jocularity on yeah, right. this day, <laughs> you know, and then it ended up, we wanted to do it three weeks ago and, and Keith was under the weather. So I was, I Joe was, and I were like, I is this freaking with the pox as it were? I know. I was like, I'm going to be really careful today because <laughs> we're on a bad stretch of outcomes here. I yeah, almost but, reached out to you, Joe. And I'm like, are you okay? <laughs> you know, I almost, I almost sent a message today. Cause I'm like, it's going to happen. We made it. We made it. Yeah. Stay yeah. inside, lock the doors, you know. <laughs> yeah, just, just stay <laughs> confined in one room. Didn't go hang gliding or anything today, you know. Yeah. Rock climbing, nothing dangerous. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but for anyone who uh, never experienced historians off the clock before, this is the first time we've done it on Twitch. And uh, I started this on other platforms. And uh, this was just a way for us as historians, whether we're public historians or we're educators uh, in the classroom, to hang out and to discuss uh, what we do, uh, the field right now, uh, the field going forward, things like that, and just off the cuff conversations. That's why I also put the disclaimer that no one is talking in, you know, as their uh, employer. <laughs> I don't want anyone to get in trouble you know, for anything that's said or a large amount of cursing and they get hauled into the office the next day. I don't want anyone to have that happen. Uh, so, so it's just a way for us to help uh, break down that barrier between this idea that there's this, you know, ivory tower and we're a part of it. We want to kind of go against that. So that's why we started this. And uh, it's good to be here on Twitch, though, hanging out. Um, I, I would really like to get both of your opinions on how your particular part of the profession is going right now because uh, we have public, histori uh, public historians on here and a uh, classroom educator. I think it's a really weird time <laughs> in, the, in the field uh, from both your perspectives, uh, at least I would think. Uh, Joe, with, with the pandemic, I've noticed a lot of the museums and nonprofits and such have been hurting because there's no, a lot of them have had less funding you know, because things have been closed. Uh, from a public historian standpoint, what's been some things that you found to be challenging at this time? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of challenging things, but I think there's also been some opportunities along the way as well, which I'm sure you've noticed. But like our biggest challenge is, that, you know, as a nonprofit and you need to justify the money you get. 
and need to continuously do things, unlike a government you know, museum or historic site, where they were under really orders that they weren't allowed to do programming. Where for us, as soon as the restrictions lifted, they lifted that you know, early July in 2020, we had to really start doing in-person programs again to make sure that we were out there and didn't really have the luxury. I don't necessarily want to call it a luxury, but didn't have the ability to say, you know, we can't do these things. Like we really had to get it back out there and kind of start mixing back in the virtual stuff that we had done, you know, that spring, but then also bring some more in-person stuff in as well. Um, so sometimes I get asked like how the pandemic's impacting us. And from a program standpoint, it made some things a bit more challenging just logistically when we try to do as many things as we could outside. Uh, but we've been really full steam ahead with doing in-person programs and being open to the public uh, since we were really allowed to that first summer. Uh, but it's definitely a challenge. I mean, our numbers for the most part aren't still back up to pre-pandemic levels, both with visitation. And that's largely because I think of less people traveling and uh, this area in particular is important for the wedding season, bringing people to wineries and to museums. Uh, so those numbers aren't quite back yet. And I see that we see that reflected in our numbers. Um, but everything as well, like fundraisers that we had planned, like it's just harder to get the same amount of people. Uh, so the cash flow hasn't been quite the same yet. So you kind of have to be creative and sometimes cut back a little bit about what you can still do and how you project moving forward as well as there's really no telling when that's necessarily going to come back. Hmm. That's really, that's, I've seen that across the board too, where I was just talking to someone who used to work for an NHL franchise and they said they, they get every time they sell tickets to a game, 20% of people don't show up. And so there's kind of this like thing of like, it's not time yet for some people. And that's, you know, just not time to be back up to what they consider being a capacity, I guess, or people get sick, uh, you know, a week out or whatever. And yeah. That's, that's interesting about visitation though. It's, it's starting to pick up in some places and in other places, it's just not back up to pre pandemic levels yet. Yeah. And everything's so connected again, it's not just the site. So what else do people do when they go to those museums or those sites? Again, like for our location, you know, we're right along route 15 and we catch people doing other things. So if you're in town for a wedding, you're looking to see what things you can do in the area. And we catch a lot of people like that or people who are, you know, there for wine country. If those things go away, then, then, you know, them looking for other things to do in the interim also goes away. So we're kind of all connected where we're all going to go up together and we've all kind of going through similar ebbs and flows. Mm. Keith, how about you? Things got weird in 2020, uh, <laughs> a little bit different, and you probably spent a lot of time digitally talking to students. How are, how are things now? Well, it, <clears throat> you're right. Things did get <laughs> pretty pretty sketchy uh, as, a, as a high school teacher. As uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm... Uh, I teach at a private high school in Los Angeles and I teach, you know, some pretty privileged kids. Uh, and so some respects, you know, I was lucky the kids had access to the resources that they needed uh, to sort of weather the storm as it were. But still, even, even with that in place, I mean, there were a number of challenges that we had to deal with, you know, the, the virtual format is really isn't the ideal format to, you know, to teach. I think uh, it's great for some things. Um, and like Joe was saying that the, you know, some of this has offered, op opened up some opportunities. I mean, here we are here having a, a digital, co a virtual conversation and, you know, in all parts of the country and it's, it works out great. So you can do that kind of thing. You can go to conferences, you can have, uh, different sort of things going on virtually, but teaching is a different story. I think in that face-to-face -face, in person, live hands-on, uh, kind of stuff we missed for, for, for an entire year and the better part of two years. <clears throat> and what I found was, especially for the younger kids, the older kids have, been around long enough and they can they can kind of handle it and they can cope with these kind of things but the younger kids really missed the uh the structure um and to a lesser extent that the discipline uh that's associated with you know high school kids and high school students and middle school students coming into high school making that sort of awkward uh transition into high school they didn't have the things that were in place that that really uh that really helped that and so you know uh what i see now is i'm, I'm sort of trying to do damage control and and fix that so i've had to you know slow down my pace a lot. I've had to, you know, break things down more for the younger kids than I would have in, in previous years. Mm -hmm. um, but, <clears throat> you know, it's one thing I think is great about kids is that they're resilient and, you know, they can they can come back from this stuff uh, fairly well, at least in my experience, uh, what I'm seeing. I don't know if that's true across the board. Like I said, my kids come from, you know, privileged backgrounds and they have lots of resources and lots of support systems in place. And a lot of kids don't have that. I mean, 
a, a, a significant amount of kids don't have that. And so, you know, I, since my experience is different, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of seeing this in a different way. And my concern is that an entire generation uh, is going to be suffering, you know, dealing with the, the repercussions of this uh, going forward for many, many years. <clears throat> and, you know, and I'm sure we're going to see that, uh, you know, with the next five, 10, maybe even 15 years, you know, depending on how long this, uh, this sticks with us. But, uh, but, but they're coming around and, um, you know, and things are beginning to uh, sort of be back to normal in a way. Uh, we're back in the classroom now, um, you know, fully masked and all that kind of stuff. So it makes it difficult sometimes for me to hear because I I can't hear very well. And, and it's difficult because you teach so much with facial expressions and reading kids and their facial expressions. Sometimes uh, it's hard when, when their faces are covered. So uh, that's a bit of a challenge. But, you know, um, I guess I'm. I guess I'm fairly lucky uh, when when you when you get right down to it. I'm I'm in a good position, and uh, and my kids are in a good spot. Uh, so so we're do, we're doing okay. We're doing okay. I was thinking about as we were going through this, all three of us. If this would have happened, you know, 25, 30 years ago, there would be no virtual learning, and we wouldn't have been doing it. So we I, I often thought about what would have been like for us thirty years ago if we would experience this or. or 25 years ago and there's no there's no zoom there's no virtual learning mm -hmm. would we would everything have just been like all right you're just gonna make up that year next year or you know i always i pondered that for a while i'm like what would have happened if because i don't know if i've ever read about that like during the 1918 pandemic mm -hmm. you know um i i kind of pondered that for a while you know i i did when i was in high school back in the 80s i uh i probably shouldn't broadcast this but i didn't do particularly well in an economics course uh, and I had to take it again. <laughs> okay. Oh, my students are listening. Okay. I made a few, I made a few missteps in, in high school. Anyway, I had to take it again, but this was the eighties. There wasn't any of this stuff. I had a mail in correspondence course. And so they mailed me the materials, the, the books and the booklets and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I read the stuff and then I took these tests that were proctored. Um, but, but, but it was all done through the mail. And then I mailed it back when I was done. And that's you know, that maybe something like that, I suppose. But it would have, logistically, I can't imagine what that would have looked like when you're talking about, you know, millions and millions and millions of students. Yeah. I assume things would have just stayed open. I mean, I don't, or that. not only the technology, but even how people, but even people hear about the pandemic, what they think about it, it would have really just come from major local news, you know, local mm. news stations, but otherwise the national news without internet to, spread information and, and wrong information too, for better or for worse. That's how people were getting a lot of information on, on the pandemic. So you got to just assume things would have just kept going, but maybe some things in some areas would have gotten canceled, like some large events like in 1918. But mm -hmm. it's hard to imagine things would have closed the way they did if it wasn't for the internet possibilities. Mm -hmm. hmm. And from an economic collapse in general, I mean, think of how many jobs move virtual, not just second, you know, from an educational standpoint. Yeah, not that ability, even with the government assistance, there's just no way to keep a society going for that long if you didn't have the Internet. Yeah, that's an interesting point, Joe. I didn't think about that. Like how our local uh, how we would have seen it locally without the Internet based impact of of it, that you're probably right. It probably would have been like, you know, we're going to keep the school open until we get slammed by this or something and then just take a week off or two weeks and like a, like a snow day, you know, kind of thing and see what's going on. I never thought of it that way. Yeah. That makes, that makes sense. Uh, are you, Keith, you still plan to come out East for, yeah, man. I'm, for, uh, uh, with we're with students. Yeah. We got a big, we got a big, uh, big group this time. Uh, 24 kids, three adults, um, in April, uh, looking forward to it. We had to cancel the last two years in a row. Uh, and now that, you know, air travel is open and, and, and really most of the time we're outside. Uh, so, so we're in a pretty good spot and, you know, G Gettysburg, uh, is, um, off season in April, really. There's not a lot of people around, even in the museums, uh, the visitor center isn't jam packed like it would be during you know, June or July. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a good time to go. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking my current class and which are, they're all juniors. That's a, that's a junior level class. And I'm taking a lot, the se last year's class that didn't get a chance to go that are now graduating this year. So it's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good size. Wow. Um, you know, so yeah, we're, we're really looking forward to it. We, in fact, I was just talking to, uh, to, uh, to, to our place today. 
um, you know, making some arrangements and everything. So you do it in Washington DC and then just hitting some sites at Gettysburg outside of it. Uh, we're going to fly in with, with flights being so astronomically expensive these days. We, the, the cheapest flight we found, um, from Los Angeles is into Pittsburgh or no, uh, Philly into Philly. So we're going to fly into Philly and drive. I think it's like two and a half hours. That's not about right. That's about right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like an hour and 45 minutes, I think from DC. So it's a little bit of an extra drive time, but, but it's worth it in the end. So, and I've never been to the Philadelphia airport. And John, you're at Pennsylvania. Has what's the what's the Philly airport? I was there. I was there once. I had to catch a flight from uh, Philly to Harrisburg, mm -hmm. and uh, it wasn't a, it wasn't that bad of an airport. I thought it was fine. It was just like any other airport. I mean, I, I think the worst airport I was ever in was Charlotte. I didn't yeah. like Charlotte, uh, but sorry to anyone from Charlotte who's watching. Uh, I just didn't like the airport. You know the airport's bad. It's okay. Yeah, the most terrifying thing for me coming out of Philadelphia on in the uh, with my airport experience was they they put us in a prop plane to go to Harrisburg, and oh. I forgot how bumpy that ride is. Those are fun though, aren't they? Yeah. Oh man, it was like being on a forty seven, dude. I'm like, what are? <laughs> what I think they're they're really to Harrisburg. Yeah, be small. That's a yeah. That's, you know, that's that's quick little jump. Yeah, I forgot what that's like. I'm like, oh man, are we going over Normandy? What's going on here? You know, it's. You're hitting those pockets in the air. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they're cool. I used to take one of those from Chicago to, what was it? Uh, we'd fly into Appleton, Wisconsin, uh, where my wife's family is from, and we'd, we'd get in those little small commuter planes, and they're fun. You know, you actually feel like you're in those you're in the big giant jets. You might as well just be sitting there. you're afraid of heights, they're not. <laughs> you <laughs> out. Oh, you dude, know. I think they're I was having a good time. Yeah. Joe, Joe, have you all gone back to your in-person events? Uh you and Travis, you know? Yeah, we we honestly, again, we started back in the summer of 2020. Oh, wow. Uh, really the first month, yeah. And we, we, we only did them outside for a while, mm -hmm. which is great because I hate outside programs because, again, you can't control everything as much as indoors. So, of course, the first event we did was at Harper's Ferry Brewing. And we were really excited to be back there. We were supposed to do it in March, but that got canceled, obviously. So we rescheduled it for like that, yeah, late July in 2020. And we're really looking forward to getting back to doing it in person. And then it's one of those things where, again, you can't control the weather, but you can't stop looking at the forecast anyways. And I remember, I think they were probably doing it as well. I remember just looking like for like two days out and there was a show in this like 50, 50 chance of heavy rain and storms. And then it kind of got worse and then better. And then I remember that whole day looking at it, I was like, I think we're going to make it. And driving up there, like just north of Harpers Ferry, it was just black clouds and i was like i don't know about this one and then when we were setting up we're like you never know like we might have a window here and then 15 minutes before we started it started clouding up rapidly and then about five minutes before we started it just downpoured oh. and then eventually we just kind of had to move things inside and it was it was a mess so wow it was a great way to kick off doing in-person programs again but we had multiple ones like we've had several that was unfortunately got luck, you know, did lock out with weather and had to postpone. And that's just the danger of having to do things outside. But yeah, we've so we've been doing them for you know a year and a half in person now. And since the, the vaccine, we started doing them indoors again. And we've got pretty good crowds, not you know, probably quite as high as they were pre pandemic, but mm. it's still fun to go back indoors. You know, we try to pick places where there's plenty of space so we're not crowding in. Um, but yeah, we're taking a little bit of hiatus and going to kick back in the spring it's it's really different right when you're doing your day-to-day -day and then you go out and do a presentation like that and i find that it's one of those things where you're because we're we're usually doing it in a bar you know my, my stuff's usually in a bar uh historians on tap is usually the bar or or a winery or something like that you're just feeding off of everyone in there at some point because you know some people are maybe have well, at least in my shows, there's some sometimes some people have one too many. They've been sitting there since 4 p.m. and having their Guinness and it's 730 and they're getting a little giggly and stuff. But it's really cool to see how people interact, you know, and, and uh, Joe, do you find that, too, where you're just like feeding off of the emotion of the crowd where they're into it? Because sometimes Keith, Keith and I've talked about this where sometimes you feed off the students, you, you see their excitement and you're feeding off of them. Adults in a pub setting is a completely different feeling for me. Yeah. I mean, you still talk about real history, which I think sometimes people might not assume and they'll assume wrongly that if it's at a brewery or something that you're not really talking about serious history or really getting in depth of anything, but the atmosphere is just a lot 
more positive. So even if you're talking about even depressing history, it's still very much a good opportunity to have good conversations before and after with people. It doesn't always have to be so serious in terms of the interaction between you and you know, individuals. It can be more lighthearted. You can make jokes. And it's just a more relaxed setting where even when we do lectures at the museum or at a library, you know, it's still a little bit more formal just because of the setting. But when you kind of bring it to a brewery, it's just inherently much more relaxed and it's more inviting for people too, where they're more, more comfortable to sit there where it's weird, you know, sitting in a library or sitting in a brewery, it's just a lot more enticing to get people to go to a brewery, even if they're not even really drinkers, but just for the fact that it is a more relaxed atmosphere. And that makes it a little easier to converse, I think as well. Uh, so I think it's really been, it's brought in new people to follow us and kind of build on a following just for those programs. But I think the interactions are really probably some of the most beneficial we've had uh, because it is a more relaxed atmosphere, even though the history is not really any different than if it was at a you know regular lecture. Mm -hmm. Keith, you would nail that out in LA. Let me tell you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I really honestly, I think it's a, it's a it's a it's a wonderful idea, you know, to to set up something like that that is informal. Because I think sometimes people do get in this in this John is why I really like this format and what you're doing is I think sometimes people think that academics or historians, whatever you they they exist in a world that is unaccessible <clears throat> and that's just i mean it's just not true uh and i mean you you can experience that i suppose uh in certain contexts but but really no i mean uh and, and, and another you know one of the things about platforms like this and you know podcasts and various other things you can kind of see that uh, historians have normal conversations and are, are real people and make jokes about stuff and say things that you know uh, our institutions might not like, you know, that kind of stuff. We, we do those kinds of things all the time, which is, uh, which is, which is, which is perfectly fine. Uh, but I, but I do think we, that a lot of people get the impression that, you know, we're sort of, uh, stuffy and, and unapproachable and that's, that's not true at all. I mean, I, I, you know, I was fortunate enough, I, I think to, to come up in a context where, you know, my, uh, my, my advisor in graduate school was, was really keen on addressing the public in some way. Uh, and, and it was always, you know, he taught me to think about the public when I'm writing and that sort of evolved into thinking about the public when I do anything. Uh, and so, you know, it's not just my academic writing, but just on my podcast and what little social media I have left. You probably noticed, John, that I completely abandoned, uh, Twitter, and Facebook. <laughs> so I tried to tag you for this stuff. I'm like, where the hell did they go? What is going on? I'd had enough yeah. uh, of it. So I still have Instagram, um. <laughs> but uh, I just I just couldn't take Twitter anymore. And if you want to talk about that and historians, I mean, I'm happy to. But um, yeah, yeah could, that's I fine. Can't. I mean, it's it, whatever goes on here. It's fine. I don't even know how you guys handle. I've never had Twitter. I mm. I don't know if I could stand it for one day. Even. The only benefit I see of Twitter is getting sports news quickly. You know, Joe, I tell you what, you would drive me nuts. when I, uh, when I first went on Twitter, um, I was an early adopter. So what was that? 2007, something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Right when it first came out, and I, it was the most wonderful thing in the world because you know, uh, uh, different historians from different different disciplines and different areas of expertise would come on, um, and and lay people would come on who had a, a you know I call them the informed public right people who were were well read and well versed in some of the you know bigger ideas even the historiography and various other things we come we'd have really cool conversations, right? Um, uh, I mean, just really productive interesting conversations and we didn't always agree on stuff but we had like these and i know i'm i'm, I'm painting this picture which almost wow this sounds really awesome where, where do i go and do this and, uh and maybe i'm being a little bit uh, uh a <laughs> little happened? bit over the top in this because there were some some you know a, a few things here and there but for the most part to the point where in the in the, in the acknowledgments of my first book i even thanked my twitter following uh and you know we had a it grew and then if i had like a question uh needed a, needed a, a citation or needed a, a source I would just put it on Twitter and I would have it instantaneously. You know, it would save me so much time. Um, but within the, you know, the last, the last four years, it's just, you know, the, the, the platform just always seemed to leave me with a bad taste in my mouth. You know, whenever I would go on there and I would see people that I had a good deal of respect for, you know, just making these sort of, and I'm not going to name names or anything. I don't have any, I don't feel like doing that, but just, you know, making these sort of baseless accusations without evidence and making sweeping generalizations about people, about their colleagues, about, you know, people who might be on the other side of the political aisle than them without it, just all kinds of stuff. And it got so nasty um, and so unproductive to me. Uh, 
uh, that I just, you know, I, I tried to back away from it and I kept getting sucked back in, you know, it's, it's like, and finally I just deleted the whole thing and I, it was, a, I've been infinitely happier since I did that. It's been several months. Um, you know, I had my withdrawals, right. Cause I was on there all the time, as you know, uh, I had a fairly decent following and I, and I was on there, uh, uh, quite a bit and I did the same with Facebook and it's been, um, it, it was, it's, it was a release, I think still on Instagram though. Uh, I'm still there. Uh, which is nice. That's a, that's my that's my happy spot for social media. But the rest of it, yeah, I just can't deal. Maybe I'll come back. That's still know. primarily memes and and pictures. So there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, no, I mean, I go on I go on Instagram and talk about books. You know, that's uh, that's pretty much what I do. Yeah, and really with Facebook, if I didn't have to have it for work, I would have deleted it a long time ago. To be honest with you, mm. it's yeah. just I have to have I, you know I have different accounts for work and posting for work. But if it was just personal stuff, like I just it just doesn't bring any sort of positivity i feel when it really comes down to it you're sad because it used to be like a web of negativity and then like you're having like arguments in your head with people who you don't even hardly know and don't even care about right. and clearly you wouldn't change anyone's mind anyways even if you did want to like, step in and converse and so it was driving nuts right yeah i'm seeing that a lot with my peer group who are on tiktok now mm-hmm. uh, <clears throat> before excuse me i'm kind of i'm coughing here on the line uh before i i was one of the early adopters of tiktok for the his, historians you know kind of where it was like there's only maybe three of us on here now i'm starting to see more people who do history coming on there and they're posting stuff where i know it's going to cause a reaction i just know right away i'm like you got it's they don't realize it probably in a moment but it's almost like they just threw the bait out there and it's just like okay you just threw the chum in the water and here mm-hmm come the sharks and then they're like wow that you know the, i'm getting so many people who are saying this awful stuff and i'm like you're throwing <laughs> you're throwing the bait in the water you gotta you know and the more i'm on there the more i see that for me personally it may not be a correct platform for what i want to do and like you guys said like like you know there's uh keith was self-aware enough to understand it was time to go off of twitter and and or or joe not having it you know and it was one of those things where the other day i was just thinking about i'm like maybe this platform is the one that's not for me (laughs) you know because (laughs) there's so many just username and nine numbers afterwards with no face and i'm like i i would just be hitting the ban button all day Mm -hmm. uh because i have no problem banning people uh so it's just one of those things where if you say something ignorant and foolish and try to drive a wedge i gotta get rid of you and I see so much of that on there. And I think it's also because the, the platform is so young compared to, you know, the, the Facebooks or Instagrams or, or whatever else. So, yeah, it's a, it's a self-awareness thing, right? Where you're, you're going to put your project up on, if you, if you, if you have one, you're going to put it up on a platform and get some notoriety for it. That's comfortable for you. And, uh, I think out of like the eight platforms that I'm on, that's the one where it's like, that's the most caustic one. And I just don't have the drive to put stuff up on there. It's just the way it is. Now I know it's great for other stuff. You know, I follow a lot of gamers on there and stuff, but for history, there's so much back and forth and people who are listening to respond, they're not listening to understand. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing, you know, that really drives a wedge. And I think that shows how you really just can't replicate in-person programs. Like if you would do something virtually, like there's inevitably, you know, it sets up inherently a, a potential clash and people taking more aggressive postures on things unnecessarily. So but when things are in person, like between tours, lectures, like, you know, talks of breweries, you know, even, you know, exhibits, pop-up things, like the dialogues are so much more pleasant. Well, yeah. experience and it's so much more productive like that's one thing that you know virtual is great in a lot of ways but it's not gonna it's never gonna fully be in person like you really can't replicate it i think the likelihood of somebody going after you in a, in a sort of a troll like fashion in person is, is not very high it's low I mean, yeah. they, they, they hide behind anonymity like you said they you know no face and you know a couple of letters with a bunch of numbers after it and you know they can go in and say whatever they want because they get a kick out of it i think they get a kick out of seeing people get you know uh react and try to argue with them and things like that. I mean, I, I, I got dragged into a number of these arguments years and years ago uh, before I left, but I finally decided to stop because that's all they're really doing is just trying to get you to do that. I think there's something, you know, 
Uh, and then, of course, your platform, you know, if, if they're getting you to argue with them, that amplifies their platform. And so they're using your following to, to send a message out. And, and, and I think that, you know, there's some there's some big, 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 big accounts and big names on Twitter that that engage in those kind of, you know, foolish arguments. And yep. um, again, without naming names, I think that uh, that's counterproductive. I don't know, you know, what good it's doing, to be honest with you, unless, it, you know, unless you enjoy doing it, you know, be my guest. But I don't know why anybody would. Um, but still, uh, you know, yeah. Do you see your students, like, are they having harder times with class discussions and conversing with each other, both between the pandemic and the fact that they're probably on five plus different social media platforms? Yeah. You know, so I teach, um, uh, the, the, the my younger kids, they're on platforms that I, I have no idea what they're even doing. I have no idea. <laughs> I guess I sound like an old guy, but some of the older ones are on like, you know, they go on Reddit and various other things and they read some uh, and they read stuff that is clearly agenda driven um, and political and they bring it to class. And I go, listen, you have to know where these people are coming from. And I'm not, in, I'm not pointing fingers at any political party or any ideology here because it's across the board. Um, you know, uh, people will use these things, a weaponize history to try to promote whatever agenda it is they're trying to promote. And the kids will bring this stuff to class. And I say, you know, as a, as, as a historian, um, I believe that the hallmark of intellectual integrity is to sort of work through these things to see where these guys are coming from, what evidence are they using, you know, what biases may they hold, um, and what's what's the point of them doing what they're doing? So they bring the stuff they they see on on websites. Um, I mean, we can take like uh, you know the the Black Confederate myth, for example, right? We'll talk about that in my Civil War course. Um, we'll talk about the sort of myth and and you know uh, that's been put together over the last hundred plus years to sort of distance the Confederate cause from slavery or racism or what what you know something along those lines, and and and, and they sort of create this this mythos of, you know, tens of thousands of, you know, blacks uh, walking away from their plantations to willing, willingly join the Confederate cause. And, you know, it's just like you, you hear this stuff and you can see this stuff on websites and they bring this to my class and go, you know, Dr. Harris, have you seen this stuff? And I go, yeah, it's just nonsense. You know, where do you think this stuff comes from? Uh, and then we talk about it. So in a, in a sense, they, you know, I, I'm happy that they come to me with some of these things without just taking it at face value. Um, and they do all the time with all kinds of stuff and not just the stuff on that end, but you know, stuff on the other side too, that, that seems fishy. Right. And so when they bring stuff to me that seems fishy, what we do is we talk about it. So it's a learning experience. Um, and I'm glad now that we're back face to face, we can have those office hours meetings where we sit in my office and just have like a real conversation um, about, you know, the use and the misuse of history. Uh, because there's lots of folks all over the place that are doing history really, really poorly right now, um, and, you know, uh, using it to promote whatever political agenda they happen to have. And so it comes up all the time you know? and they follow the rabbit holes because I, I guess they have a lot of time on their hands. I, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> but they but they tend to do that. And so, yeah, we have we've had some pretty, pretty good, productive conversations about it. I think I have some open minded kids, though. I keep, you know, I, I, I keep saying that I'm, you know, I'm lucky and I'm fortunate that, that I have uh, that I have the kids that I do. And a lot of them, even the ones that maybe resist uh, at first, you know, after a while, after a number of conversations, they begin to open their mind to different ideas. And I think it's really important as an educator to get kids to realize that, you know, there is not one way of thinking about things. There's not necessarily a right or a wrong way. This is like, you know, you've got to open your mind to other people's perspectives, even those that with whom you disagree uh, to see where they're coming from. And, you know, uh, that, that I think is, is, is probably the, you know, the greatest joy of seeing kids grow as, uh, as students, you know, when I send them off to college, they're going to go well-equipped, hopefully. Mm. Mm. Joe, is there a, uh, <clears throat> is there a platform that you like to utilize to get the word out about historians on tap or any of your own work? Is there something out there that works for you? Kind of like Instagram works for Keith, or are you kind of like, I'll just post on there when it's necessary and get get the hell off, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, we're the historians on tap. We're not super active on it. It's really just to help promote when we do have events coming up. Uh, I mean, Facebook is still pretty effective by and large. Uh, but Instagram, too, it's very different followers, mm -hmm. which, especially like for the museum as well. I try to do not always the same kind of content, like some Instagram things, some Facebook things, because there are very different – people and like what things get reactions are very different. Uh, I mean, I just don't have it in me to do a Twitter page or anything beyond that. I mean, I can really only handle Instagram and Facebook for the museum or 
historians on tap. Um, but I mean, they're both different crowds, which I think is, makes it pretty fun and then helps you mix it up as well. So it's not like you're only throwing one thing out there and that's it, you know, mix it up a little bit for what works better for the scrolling Instagram crowd in terms of visuals. Um, you know, I've had things that have gotten you know great responses on Instagram and then on Facebook, absolutely nothing. And the opposite too. So I think you kind of learning the audience and learning what's more effective on a more content-based one like Facebook can be uh, is really the way to go. But maybe something new will come along. I mean, there's it's just there's so much out there. I, I feel like via social media, in terms of what's at least working, Facebook and Instagram are still the the two main ones. Yeah, Keith, I uh, I kind of felt that way about podcasting. Mm. I was thinking that. Uh, I kind of scratched that itch mm -hmm. and I felt like there are so many out here podcasting now that it was just getting lost in the weeds. And it's almost like uh, I got to do something else other than this right now. And uh, you, you podcasted a lot more than I did. Uh, how, what are your thoughts on, on that sort of thing? Yeah, I feel kind of the same way that you did. I did it for, I'll say four years. I had that show running for about four years, I think. Um, had you know some some heavy hitting historians on had some great conversations for you know and i got it to the point where i was doing it you know twice a week uh which was labor intensive but but i enjoyed it and you know i i got some traction with it oh, yeah. um you know and it was it was getting some good traction and i was you know my name was getting you know handled around passed around and you know and, and, and so I, I was i was getting a, a good following there but when the pandemic, well, it already kind of started, but when the pandemic hit, it really uh, accelerated and suddenly everybody had a podcast and that's great. You know, um, mm -hmm. I encourage anybody who wants to talk about history to talk about it in any format that they possibly can. But the, it did. It was so many out there. It's like, you know, I, I mean, I, I found myself, I was subscribed to, you know, dozens and dozens. How am I going to listen to all of these? You know, and um, I thought, you know, for the time being, I'm just going to let that simmer. Uh, and so I've got season one, which is like 2016 to or 2020. And I'm going to let that sit there for a while on my website. And then, you know, I'm going to re try to reimagine what the podcast is uh, and rethink it for maybe, maybe no promises, but maybe the summer is to resurrect that. But in a somewhat different way, I mean, the, the you know, the 45 minute interview um, is, is great, but it's not particularly imaginative and, um, or, you know, novel. Uh, so I was trying to think of some other thing that I might do. So I'm working, I'm kicking around some ideas, um, that might be cool for, for, uh, a podcast type thing, you know, make it more of a show that's in a podcast format, um, that does some other, does some other things apart from the sort of traditional interview. Mm -hmm. it, you know it's coming but but i think i feel the way um you know there's a lot of people that i've spoken to about this that have done podcasts in the past that feel the same way it's like this it's really saturated right now yeah and, and yeah like you said it's a lot of work i don't mm -hmm. friends who aren't historians or aren't in the field at all and really only know whatever history is from randomly things i've told them and they're like oh you should start a podcast i was like are you kidding me like <laughs> the work that takes to go into like i don't have time for that and you know is the reward worth it where i feel like maybe some future podcasts, it almost be like a radio show where it's a little bit of a variety. Like mm -hmm. you're talking history, but like you're also talking about the football game from a few days ago or other things, you know, kind of brings in it where it almost becomes part of people tune in because they feel like it's a part of a little bit of a community and you get a little bit of a variety of things too. Like you would on more of like a radio show kind of thing rather than a traditional podcast, which you're right. I mean, there's so many, and especially for people who are you know already really busy, like do you necessarily want to listen to only a history podcast if you've been doing that all day? If you know if you're in the field, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah I mean, there's, there's all kinds of ideas. I mean, I, I like the, the the variety, you know, the variety angle of it, and and it's something that I, I kind of tried to do a little bit um, when I was doing interviews and try to have like a somewhat more informal conversation uh, with historians, talk about their work. And Joe, like you were saying, I mean, this is like really super labor intensive because, of course, you have to be familiar with all of their work, right? They have a new book coming out. You've got to read the book. You've got to prep. You've got to do all the, the front end stuff, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to get ready for these things. Um, so you've got good questions ready to go and that kind of thing. And you got to be able to handle, you know, and, I, and I, do, I do a lot of Civil War stuff, but I was bringing in people from all kinds of fields. And so, 
you know, you have to do your homework. And then of course there's the technical angle of it. So if you're not technically savvy, uh, it can, it can be a bit of a struggle. And there's a lot of different platforms that make it easy. Uh, so for folks like me who aren't really good with technology, you can just sort of kind of drag and drop a lot of the stuff and edit and, and it makes it a little bit easier. Um, and then of course there's the promotion end of it. So it's really, really labor intensive. There's a lot of stuff going on with the podcast. Um, but, but, but I like the idea, you know, Joe, what you were saying is like to, to make it about, a community or about a conversation where it's not just sort of like what we're doing now, right? I mean, we talked about history. We'll talk about all kinds of things. Um, and that that would be, a, 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 I think, a good way to sort of transition from the older traditional style into something a little bit more user or a little bit more uh, uh, public friendly, maybe. Yeah, I think, I think you, when you have yeah. kind of the 45-minute segments like we used to do, you know, where we would talk to someone for 45 minutes about whatever it is with their book or uh, something they're doing in the field or, you know, whatever it may be. It almost became like listening to the professor in the three piece suit behind the podium who does, who just drones mm -hmm. because it was getting lost in the translation, right? By, by, by 15 minute mark, I'm already checking out and this is my jam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, And I'm like, if I'm checking out, what's, you know, what's the guy down the street or the woman down the street doing They're they're checking out too. So it's just that human behavior kind of thing where uh, so many people got on board and I love it. Don't get me wrong. Like we said, I love people creating. I think it's fantastic that I'm not one of these people who's in competition with someone. I don't like that. You know, it's, it's not why I'm here. Uh, so I want as many people who wants to do it, to do it. It's just for me personally, uh, it got to the point where it's like, I just, everyone's doing it. And I always had to be someone who was trying to do something else when everyone else is doing something else. That's why I'm on this platform, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, I, I completely get that where it's kind of like, you just take a step back because now is not the right time. And you know, it just doesn't feel right. And just reimagine things. I mean, there's always going to be new ideas and innovations in this, in this field, you know, and, 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 and we do have uh, the platforms available for us and who, I mean, I think Joe, you were mentioning who knows what's coming down the line, right. Mm -hmm. You know, who, what platform is next. And so they're, I would have never even considered something like this uh, a couple of decades ago. Is you know this is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy what all has transpired. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. WF Chess, thank you for this. Uh, the issue with a lot of platforms is there's no room for nuanced discussion. Yeah, like we said, it's it's people are people see it in black and white. That's it. I don't want to hear anything else. Yeah, I mean this is that's a, that's a really good point, and I actually like this platform because it has that comment feature in there that people can come in mm -hmm. and you can have, I think you can have nuanced conversations in that way. You know, if you can dial it into certain things like that, especially you have to have open-minded people too, don't you? I mean, yeah. you know, you don't want to, people like to entrench themselves into whatever it is they want to entrench themselves in. And then they're, they're unbending on their ideas. I, that isn't particularly helpful. Yeah. That's a, sorry, John, interrupt. But that's a, a failing of a lot of academics and historians is that they're so entrenched in the idea that they really can't take a question that might be wrong or an answer that might be wrong and really spin it to see, you know, where there's some merit. Like that's one thing like in class, I always try to do like ask a question. If the answer is not right. I mean, it's not the end of the discussion. You don't, you know, shun them. Like you really bring up, you know, there's aspects of that or, you know, look at angles for it. And I think that's one thing social media really misses. And a lot of people really don't want to. I don't know if it's because they just don't see the value in really trying to, you know, spin even a wrong question or something misguided. And really, because that, all that does is, you know, if you just say you're wrong to someone, well, how do people react to things? Like, no one must be told that. Like, they're going to completely, sh you know, go into a shell. They're not going to engage. I mean, that's like, the, I think the number one thing to do. And it's a challenge. But, I mean, it really brings people in. And I there's many people over the years say, like, having a very casual and laid back like classroom atmosphere was like the biggest thing they took away from the class because they felt comfortable saying things and they weren't afraid that they were going to get laughed at essentially for giving the wrong answer. So, you know, they didn't just keep their opinion to themselves out of fear of what, you know, someone might say to their question or their answer to something. And I think the social media, that clue you don't get where you again you don't get that respect necessarily and the back and forth that you do with someone in a classroom or during a lecture or even just in a more informal setting like this, even virtually. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would encourage, you know, 
pretty much anybody, but especially teachers, is to like sort of take that wall down and kind of, um, you know, and, 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 and acknowledge that. And it's something I like to do with my students all the time is to acknowledge the, the very real possibility that I'm wrong about everything that I say. Uh, that's 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 altogether possible and, and, and maybe even probable in some cases. Right. And I, and I, I always want my students to challenge me if I say something and, and you know, once they, they don't agree with it because of what they read or the evidence that they have found or what have you, I want them to challenge me on it. And, you know, and, and we go back and forth. I, and I and, you know, I'll say this over and over again. My very, 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 very best students are the ones that I argue with all the time. And they're productive arguments. They're not like angry arguments. They're arguments about, you know, they're debates, they're friendly debates with my students. And we, we go at each other constantly uh, in, a, in, in, in the spirit of, you know, finding the truth with a capital T if such a thing actually exists. Um, but we go after it in that spirit. And those are my, those are my, my greatest students um, who go off and do, you know, do great things after, after high school. Uh, but we, but we really need to do that. You know, that's, that's how we get from point A to point B, you know, we're not, not entrenching ourselves in our own ideology and ideas, but, but open ourselves up to other things. And we can only, you know, I, and even if we disagree with some of the things that we hear, it can only help us, I think, you know, uh, refine our points, uh, sharpen our arguments, you know, to yeah. understand someone else's world experience, you know, something like that. I mean, just thinking back to views I had and thoughts I had in high school and college, I mean, what was wrong with me looking back, you know? But again, it's not like you're being shunned and cast away. Like, it's a learning process mm -hmm. in high school. But, you know, in college as well, like, my views have changed. My outlook on, you know, so many things has changed. And, like, if you're not constantly growing, but you have to be in an environment that caters to that. And if you don't have it where, like, you can grow and you can make mistakes and, you know, have wrong opinions that, you know, you – change your mind and that's okay i mean we're in such an era where things will be thrown back at you you know either you'll get shut down immediately for an opinion and then you're like oh shit i'm not going to give an opinion again mm -hmm. like, crazy or you know somebody from 10 years ago like this you know the popular media when sometimes things pop up in people's lives from 10 years ago and it's like well people grow like it's just crazy to me how sometimes and i think that's goes back to the same kind of person who just wants to be combative on social media is it they just like the trying to tear someone down. I, I think it's also a fear thing. Some people are just afraid to be wrong, you know, and, and they just get defensive automatically because they're just, that's the greatest fear is to be proven wrong about something or they're, you know, I've, I've saw that time and time again, you know, in, in grad school and stuff where students would argue with the professor about something and it would get heated arguments. It wasn't a discussion anymore. Mm. And it would get heated with the professors who, said okay that's good but let's take it a step further let's take that point a step further let's go a little bit deeper on that and they would hate that because they're like okay i gave you the answer i'm done <laughs> you know and and if it was wrong it was wrong i don't want to go any deeper than that and i always was agitated sometimes at my profs because i would say an answer and they'd be like okay let's take it another step further what do you mean by this what do you mean by that sometimes that gets on some students you know in a certain ways but they're the ones that I respected the most. Those professors were the ones I respected the most because they they forced me to think beyond that one line answer or that two line answer. And I and I'll always remember that. It was kind of like the professors that were the hardest on me were the ones that I respected the most. And I think we've lost that in some ways in our day to day life now. You know, it's just react, move on, react, mm -hmm. move on. Yeah. No. And, and, and certain certain things have come out, you know, with with uh, different books that have come out lately. People have an opinion on it. They've never read it. <laughs> you know, it's like just read it first and then get back to me. You know, yeah. don't, don't. And especially because sometimes I'll get copies from a pub publishing house. And you you two may have experienced this, too, where you get a book that's not even on the shelf yet, mm -hmm. like a reader copy. And people have already formulated an opinion on it. And it's like, I haven't even read it. It's not even published on the, on the shelf. How How is your opinion here? Unless you have a same thing. And they're like, no, I just heard this about it. And it's like, you got to read it, you know? Um, yeah, that, John, that happens. Oh, that happens all the time. And I think people often associate, you know, a person's scholarship with you know, them personally. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. How do you feel about using a particular example? I'm, I'm, you know, I mean, Alan Gelzo's book uh, that just came out on Robert E. Lee. 
mm -hmm. um, that months before that came out, you know, people were dragging it on Twitter mm -hmm. um, and nobody had read it yet. How could they have possibly, you know, and, 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 and how can, and, and, and I've read it, I've read it. It's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent book. And Alan Gelso is a, a first rate historian uh, without question. Uh, he and I might disagree on some other things, but his scholarship is perfect as far as I'm not perfect, but damn good <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. And it's a solid book, um, you know, written about a controversial figure. Uh, and I don't think anybody's had the final word on Robert E. Lee yet. And so there needs to be more books on Robert E. Lee. The more that come out, you know, the better. And I know, you know, we, we, we don't like him anymore, right? Uh, but still, uh, he's an important figure in American history and we need, to, we need to learn about him. So people were attacking that book like crazy months before it came out. I don't know. That yeah, I mean, I mean I heard you were John. You were a little more critical. I I liked it mm -hmm. personally. I thought it was a good read, and I was I was pretty favorable on it. I mean, it wasn't the most. I Means Robert E. Lee. There's a lot of that you know about him. So it, you know, it's not like yeah. huge surprises here. But you know, it's a good biography. But yeah, I didn't think he could you know, have to take a stance, and that like you can't just say it's okay. Like you have to be, you know, this is terrible. This is perfect. Sometimes I think people feel like they have to be extreme sometimes when it's really not called for. Maybe so. I mean, I, you know, honestly, I, uh, I didn't, I didn't think there was anything particularly groundbreaking in that book, but it was still a very good book and he's an excellent writer. And so he, you know, takes a figure and humanizes a figure, I think in a ways that people have forgotten about. And, uh, and that's, that's the thing with Lee. I think it's important to understand that he's flawed as you know, any human being is, and that he fought for a cause that, you know, uh, it's a despicable cause, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's an you know important guy to understand. And so, I mean, I, if reading the book and being critical of the book is, is perfectly fine with me, mm -hmm. uh, but being critical of it without reading it mm -hmm. seems kind of silly. Uh, so, so John, I think you're absolutely right about that. Yeah, I mean, I was I was critical of it only because there was no really new stuff that came mm -hmm. out of it, in my opinion. Uh, and again, this is my opinion. It's mm -hmm. and I can be dead wrong. I you know. Uh, I read it. I wasn't blown away by like any new stuff or anything like that. A great, great writer. No oh, doubt yeah. about that. Fantastic. You know, fantastic writer. I love the prose in it. It was great. It flowed really nicely. I, I kept turning the page. Mm -hmm. I kept going, you know, and uh, I read it pretty quickly because of that. Uh, but I just felt that there's nothing groundbreaking there. I just saw it as uh, a conservative historian finally mm -hmm. says that Robert E. Lee was a traitor. You know, that was, that was, that's pretty interesting that he said to me, that's the way I saw it. And that was, but that's just me, you know, you, you guys saw it differently and that's great. Uh, like the late meatloaf said, two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll run with that one. That's, that's cool. our, that's the historians off the clock review. Yeah, there it is. I was much more critical of his book on Gettysburg. Uh, that I thought he, he took, he took a couple of swings and misses with that one. Um, yeah. But, He's always uh, been harsh on Mead, and I, I think that's where I have a sticking point with him. Yeah, um, I, 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 was, I, 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 I felt the same way. I think um, with his Gettysburg book, I think the way he set it up is it was leads to win or lose, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it didn't give enough credit to the Union Army, uh, you know, for, for, for actually doing things that defeated Robert E. Lee in there. So I think he looked at, you know, uh, in a sort of a typical way, I think, and I think a lot of historians take this approach. You know, it's like what Confederate made what mistake, and that's why they lost, they lost the battle there. And it doesn't, you know, like George Pickett. I think George Pickett allegedly. I don't know if he actually said this. And Joe, you're, you're laughing. You know the quote uh, when asked. You know, what happened, as you, as yeah. you <laughs> right. I think the Union Army had something to do with it, right? And and uh, and, and I think he's right. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's even if that's an apocryphal quote or not, but um, you know, it's a good one. Whether either way. But yeah, this was making history fun too. Like, it's good that we don't all agree on the same yeah. the same books. <laughs> like, if you actually yeah. read them and you have actually you know balanced opinions and mm -hmm. reading behind it, I mean, otherwise we'd be out of jobs because we'd all be done. <laughs> One book comes out on something and that's it. Right, right, and, and that's that. Like you say, Joe, that's the beauty of it. You know, some people would be arguing about the fact that. You know, if they were in my shoes, they'd be arguing with you two about it. And I'm just like, no, that's how it's supposed to work. You know, mm -hmm. some people are good. It, you know, Cisco and Ebert sometimes never agreed on a movie. You know, many times never agreed on a movie. So it's just one of those things where we could read the same book and we have read the same book. All three of us have read that book. And we've come to conclusions that aren't going to be agreeable amongst one of us. And mm -hmm. that's fine. That's that's the way it goes. You know, I like the Gettysburg book better than I did the Lee book. But that was just me. Um, but, you know, and someone else come along and say the exact opposite. And that's great. 
you know um, i think that we need to have that more in in the context of the field where people are not you know if we posted those on twitter like that could you imagine <laughs> what would happen you know if keith comes on there and he says what he said here and then i come mm -hmm. on and say yeah i agree with you but what did it, what did it prove and i go into my thing it would blow up you know because people don't talk like this when they're on mm -hmm. twitter you know or whatever or platform you want to put it on mm -hmm. so yeah it's I, I love the fact that we can sit and have disagreements on the latest books or, or movies or whatever else. That's what makes it more fun. You know, you have to have kind of thick skin when you're a historian. You do. You, you really do. do. Learn that in graduate school. <laughs> the first, <laughs> yeah. first year was hard. It's like, why is everybody being so mean to me? It's like, <laughs> this, this is where no. Yeah. Yeah. Graduate school is just terrible. <laughs> like, not yeah. only have thick skin, <laughs> like, you realize how much you don't know. Mm, that's what it was. It's just like you realize that history, you know, you better really get familiar with historiography quick. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, realize that's really what grad school is going to come down to. Like, yeah, it's a tough first year. For no, I think my first year in graduate school, I got, I, you know, because I did really well as an undergraduate, you know, and I thought, okay, well, okay, graduate school is just going to be like that, except it's going to be a little bit harder. And I said, I was dead wrong about that. So I, uh, I had a, my first year of grad school was rough. You know, and once I found my legs and figured out that it was really, you know, about the historiography, it's about all that kind of thing. And once I figured out how to do all that, then I, you know, things, things turned around for me. My first year was tough in graduate school. I didn't know if I was going to make it or not. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that went through a pretty rigorous program, but, you know, but, but, but it, it can, it can be, you know, pretty soul crushing, <laughs> um, you know, uh, the, and, and for those and for those of you listening who who are considering it, it can be. You have to you know accept that. But at the same time, it can be very rewarding too. I mean, you make good friends, you, you have lasting relationships, you you know learn like this insane amount of cool stuff. Um, you know, uh, you're not much fun at parties after that because that's all you want to talk about. You know, but uh, but uh, <laughs> but no, it's it can, it can be a rewarding experience also. I think. Yeah, yeah, it is a culture shock a little bit. Yeah, no joke. Yeah, kind of courses and yeah, I mean, yeah. I, mean I had a you know I had a tough adjustment from high school to college, you know I had a you know tough adjustment from college to grad schools. I mean, some people are ready for it and you know probably do it faster, but yeah, it, it's an adjustment. Yeah, I took I took a gap decade uh, between high school and college, so I uh, I went out into the world and worked and you know played some music and did some other stuff, and so I didn't go to college until I was uh, twenty nine. Um, so I, I kind of went in more mature. If I'd have gone in right out of high school, I'm pretty sure I would have washed out. I don't think I would have had the discipline uh, mm -hmm. to to handle uh, to handle undergraduate uh, work. So I'm, I'm actually kind of glad I did that. Yeah, I was the same way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I went to a two year program after high school because that's what my family wanted me to do, and they were paying for it. But accounting is not my thing, so I did it, and then I. I was like, I was 20 when I graduated with my degree in accounting and I didn't go back to get my history until I was 29 mm -hmm. and I was paving roads, working in warehouses, doing all that stuff. And I got to the point where I'm like, I want to do what I want to do because I don't want to do this mm -hmm. the rest of my life. And I think without that, you're right, Keith, without that life experience, I would have been someone else who would have just been like, I don't know what I'd be doing, you know, right now. So that life experience changed me. I know that. I mean, shoveling asphalt all day will change you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, absolutely. I'll get your I'll get your ass in order pretty quickly. Yeah. You know? okay. And you're like, oh man, I don't want to do this next 20 years. Mm -hmm. You know. <laughs> um, but yeah, being being a historian made uh, my life a little easier when I went through my divorce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Honestly. Because you got thick skin. You're like, what are you gonna what are you gonna tell me that I haven't already heard? Uh, my grad school already told me I sucked at something. What are, gonna, <laughs> what are you gonna do? You know, I mean hell. No, I hear you. So yeah. You. What uh what are you looking forward to doing uh here in 2022, Joe? Anything coming up that you're really looking forward to doing in uh in or out of the field? Well, I'm still kind of in the, the grieving process after last week's football games, to be honest with you. So I'm Hoping things get a little better after the Bills game on Sunday night. Um, I was like thinking all week. I was like, man, a big part of my week is, you know, I love to read, you know, all sorts of sports articles. I love to listen to, you know, sports radio. And like, I couldn't do anything this week after. I was so traumatized. 
Sunday's loss and so hurt by it. I was like, man, I've got to, I've got to get to spring because like now is when summer re- or like summer seems far away and winter just seems like it lasts forever. Yeah. Um, you know, I've got a lot project wise that are a bit different that I'm kind of just starting to gear up for. So it's always fun whenever I kind of start doing research on a, a topic that's not necessarily a specialty of mine or they don't have a lot of background in. Mm. So that, that one good thing is, you know, we are closed to the public for uh, some renovations until March, but that does help with then freeing up kind of, we did the same last year, freeing up some time to start doing some research for an upcoming exhibit. And that's probably what I'm looking for professionally is wise kind of getting kind of into some new history that I'm not super familiar with locally. Uh, yeah. Personally, I just need to get out of the, the football season and, be able to get outside again once it's not not winter. Nice. Keith, how about you? Well, you know, I don't follow sports, really. Um, I think Formula One racing is pretty cool, but that's about as far as I go in terms of following sports. So I don't have that. Uh, I don't have that burden, I think. So if, uh, I guess when I was younger, I followed the Dodgers a little bit, you know, being on the West Coast. But I kind of lost interest in that after a while. But uh, it's definitely a burden. What's that? It, it's definitely a burden. burden. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess if there's a Dodger game on, I would watch it. You know, just uh, just because I, I I think the sport is kind of fun, but but I, I don't get too uh, too caught up in all that kind of stuff. But you know, what I really want to do, and this is something that I spend I spend way too much time uh, in my study. I mean, I love it here. I'm, I'm surrounded by all these wonderful books, and I love reading, and I love doing this. But I got to get outside. That's something that uh, that I miss doing more you know i used to hike a lot more and i used to do all kinds of things and to get outside and do that kind of thing so i'm looking forward to maybe doing that this summer but professionally um you know i i uh i I want to develop some classes that that really get into you know deep into specialized fields like it would be really cool i think to do a a course on you know american slavery at the high school level uh, you know, again, I have the you know, I have the latitude to create these courses if I want. I have the, some of the resources. So I mean, I, I've said this multiple times already that I'm very privileged in that way, and I acknowledge that. But I would like to be able to do that, you know, at the high school level to get you know down to uh, down to that level and really go through the historiography of American slavery, go through you know the uh, the Freedom documentary set, the uh, the Barbara Fields and Ira Berlin thing out of uh, out of Maryland, and really break down the you know, the firsthand uh, accounts of that to to understand just how deeply entrenched that institution is in United States history uh, to help us to help kids, you know, that don't really get, I think, the legacy of slavery and how pronounced that is um, in the United States in so many ways. Uh, so I know there's a lot of people that disagree with me and say that, you know, maybe we should move on, uh, maybe not dwell so much on those kinds of things. I mean, I think I would disagree with them. Uh, love to talk to them about it, but I think it's an important topic. Uh, and so that'd be a cool class to take. So I want to, you know, develop more of those kinds of things, more seminars uh, for my advanced kids. You know, I, when I started teaching high school, I wasn't sure that kids, 17, 16, 17 year olds had the maturity to deal with some of the stuff. And I was, uh, pleasantly uh corrected in that they they really do if you give them you know the chance to think deeply about these kinds of things they can they can pull it off and and i've got kids that are doing stuff that you know when i was TAing at the university of virginia you know i'm, I'm not going to throw uva under the bus those are my that's my crew but but uh, i mean I've, I've got kids producing work right now that's better than a lot of the stuff that i read when i was TAing undergraduates at the university of virginia you know they can they can do it they can they can really uh come up with some thoughtful uh analysis uh, some engaging stuff if you give them the chance and i think more teachers need to give their kids the chance you know mm-hmm. so i'm looking forward to doing that kind of stuff in the in the coming in the coming years and that's a great idea i mean i'm just thinking back to high school myself like two of the probably most impactful classes i took were new classes that were almost exploratory by the same mm-hmm. the same teacher one was a humanities class and then it was just really called the humanities and then another one, you know, an anthropology class that was kind of new being offered. And I took both of them. So I had taken multiple classes with this this teacher. And, like, it just kind of made me think about things in such a different way, especially because I knew I liked history. Mm-hmm. And I kind of was kind of exploring, you know, what do I do? Do I want to teach history? You know, do I want to explore it all? And taking those kind of classes really kind of got me thinking about worldviews, challenging, you know, conceptions I had, and then really helping kind of map out maybe what, I might want to pursue more fully when I get to college. Yeah, that's cool, man. I didn't have anything like that in high school. Nothing at all. I had your sort of standard, you know, yeah, I didn't even. U.S. history and, and, and I think 
some sort of European history. And that's, that's really, I mean, that's it. You know, I, I, I would love to have, I mean, I, I don't know if I, I'm not qualified to teach, you know, like, uh, uh, any, so I mean, my outside field in grad school was West Africa. I'm not even close to qualified to teaching that, but I would love to, you know, have that class available for my kids and work with work with other uh, teachers uh, to develop things like this. Um, you know, just to give just to give kids a a chance to to broaden their understanding, broaden their horizons, to think about fields in different ways. You know, and some of the methodologies that you use in in in, in non Western uh, cultures and non Western histories are, are different than what you might use if you're relying on texts and various other things like that. So there's all kinds of things that you can do. And I would love to be able to bring that into the high school level. Mm. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Because I was the same way. I didn't have, I was like you, Keith. I just had U.S. history and like European history. And that's that's it. That yeah, was- my history teacher sucked too, man. He was, uh, <laughs> he seems like it, he was like, I think he'd been doing it for 150 years. And he was oh, just God. going through the motions, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and And I went to a pretty decent public school and Santa Barbara, you know, it's, uh, uh, so I don't know, this guy just, you know. dude, Santa Barbara in the eighties <laughs> had to be legit, by the way. <laughs> God. Yeah. I had hair out to you. I was going to say, do you have yeah. big hair? And yeah. A huge hair, giant hair. It was, it was bleach blonde and it stuck like way up. And it was, I, I kept Aquanet in business, I think uh, for at least a couple of years. Yeah. Santa Barbara in the eighties was something else. Oh man, the weather that's, was that's, great. That's the history you got to write too. <laughs> I should write that. You, you should. Know, the, the Santa Barbara music scene in the 1980s. It was like we had like some local celebrities and stuff. Um, you know that we'd all go to the summer concert series at you know the Galita Valley Community Center and these like you know these kind of it was just a lot of fun. It was it was a good it was a good place to grow up. It was enough trouble to get into, but not so much trouble that you know uh, where it was overly dangerous. I think, but there was. Yeah, it, it was fun. We had a good time. Where were you living between that and then going to UVA? Were you in California all the way up? Yeah, to- I was uh, in, in Los Angeles. And so I went to UCLA undergraduate. And then when I was done with that, I um, uh, moved to, to Charlottesville for, I think I was there for seven years uh, to complete the program and then came back to LA. So I'm not, I'm not from here. I'm from Alabama originally, but my, but my family moved to uh, Southern California in 76, 1976. So I pretty much grew. I was a little kid, so I pretty much grew up on the West Coast. Was that a big culture shock for you to from from mm-hmm. uh, from West Coast to Charlottesville? Yeah, it was it was huge. It was um it was you know a, so I I didn't live in Charlottesville. I lived outside of Charlottesville in the in the in the Shenandoah Valley, um in a little community called Stewart's Draft, which is kind of sandwiched between Waynesboro and Stanton, if you're familiar at all. Uh, with that area and it's a little little small town that rolls up the sidewalks at six o'clock at, you know in, in the afternoon you, you, it's just it was a very different vibe um, you know and and i never really quite fit in ever uh and so you know i was happy to come back to the west coast and that's not you know nothing nothing on virginia it's a cool place uh but um you know i'm i'm, I'm a real west coast guy real big city guy mm. you know uh, so i i like it out i like it out here but yeah, it was a huge culture shock, man. Just yeah. night and day. Yeah, so I can imagine Santa yeah. Barbara to Charlottesville. Well, Santa Barbara to, to Los Angeles uh, to Charlotte. To Char- oh. Char- that was a yeah, that was a, that was a big one. Wow, that's cool. that's crazy. Yeah, mm-hmm. that that is a book in itself. I can't re- wait to read your autobiography someday about that. <laughs> I don't know who on earth would be interested in that, but you know, um, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who you knows? can self-publish. It'll be fine. I could. You could. You could. You could distribute it as an NFT, and it'll be I fine. I could. Right. <laughs> and I've just recently found out what that was. This is how, how behind the times I am. No, you're ahead. You're mm-hmm. ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of people don't know what the hell that is, so it's fine. Um, I'm actually thinking of in 2022. I'm actually thinking of uh, taking some time and and looking at virtual worlds and virtual reality from the historical standpoint. Mm. and doing some stuff on that because I have the Oculus headset and all that. And I'm thinking Mm. about doing some stuff on there to mix things up a little bit and to, you know, do some reviews of things. And I know there's like a Titanic experience and there's like also, but the, but national geographic also has virtual worlds on there where you can go to the different spots around the world and see like, you know, Machu Picchu and and all this stuff. So I want to, check that out and see what's going on. So 
I guess I've become so accustomed to not being around people. I'm just going to put myself in a different world altogether and just hang out there and be like, we'll just do our pub thing from in the virtual reality space. That's, that's fine. You know, it's much sure, less why fights, So that's good. <laughs> why not? Why not? But Hey, I appreciate you guys coming on. This has been fantastic. I don't want to take up any more of your time, but uh, this has been a long time coming and I'm glad we could finally get on here together and hang out for a while on Twitch. Yeah, me too. Thanks. This is this. Uh, I've been looking forward to this. Um, so I was glad to be here. Yeah. yeah, this is the first it's virtual program I've done in a while at this point, which is probably a good sign for the pandemic that mm -hmm. you're know, being forced to notice. Yeah. Again, like I think there's always going to be a hybrid form of virtual in person, but it's fun to be able to do this. Like when else could you know, three people from three different states kind of just you know get together and not have it be a completely unusual thing. Yeah, that is very cool. That's true. Yeah, yeah I think I think you're right. Joe. Silver lining to all of this stuff. I think there, 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 I think there is going to be a thing where we'll we'll definitely go back to in person stuff, and we'll get our vibes with that, and we'll go back to tours at historical sites and everything. But I think this is still going to be a part, a component, even if it is a lesser component. Uh, you know, in the future, uh, I still think it's going to be a thing, and and I hope it is because I, I built my project on these things, so I hope it keeps going or I'm screwed. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but again, guys, I appreciate your time. It's been awesome, and uh, thank you so much for coming on the on the Twitch platform for something a little different. So, right. Well, thanks, John. Anytime. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Everybody, thank you for uh, following along with us this evening and being a part of the conversation and being in here. Thank you for all the new follows and uh, everyone jumping in the chat. Uh, I appreciate everyone hanging out with us. We'll see you very soon right here on Twitch. Keep reading and stay healthy, everybody. Take care.